engineer of Number Nuclear, I almost forgot it there for a second, um, on powering the next giant step. And just a couple of uh, notices before we begin. The talk will last about 45 minutes with maybe about 15 minutes of question and answers at the end. We will have a roving mic, I believe, for anyone who wishes to ask any questions. We will then also have the um, museum open for another hour or so after the talk for anyone who wants to look around and learn about, about the history of Rolls-Royce. Finally, the, some of you might have noticed there are leaflets on the table advertising other local IOP events, so if you enjoy this one, please uh, consider attending some more. And now, without further ado, I'll hand you over to uh, Jake Thompson. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Ben. And um, yeah, thanks everybody for coming. Some uh, very friendly and familiar faces in the audience. So uh, I'm not looking forward to questions and answers later. Um, so yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, so my, yeah, my name's Jake Thompson, as Ben said, and I'm the chief engineer for uh, a relatively new part of the business called uh, no Novel Nuclear. Um, so I've been in the IOP for about, uh, actually for about 20 years now, because I joined as an undergraduate, um, did a physics degree and joined, joined Rolls-Royce 16 years ago, uh, thanks to a member of this audience, actually, so thanks to you. Um, and I've spent the last 16 years uh, in our nuclear business, uh, mainly um, working on submarine propulsion, uh, with a, a few forays out to do a few other things uh, in that time. And then about three years ago, um, joined a, a, a new small team, um, essentially looking at new, new business opportunities. And that's grown into the part of the business that we call Novel Nuclear. Um, and a really, really exciting focus area for that business is, um, is space nuclear power. So the topic of the next 45 minutes is power in the next giant leap, and can the UK play a part in uh, the Artemis missions and that next generation of space exploration, um, which I'll steal my own conclusion, oh, I think we can. Um, and we've got some you know, almost unique capability in the UK to position ourselves to, to do that um, through space nuclear power. So hopefully in 45 minutes or so, you'll, you'll agree with me that the UK can play a part in uh, this really, really exciting um, space exploration journey that uh, we're just about to start again. So some of you probably saw this um, uh, not that long ago, uh, last month, um, or no, this month actually. So this is uh, the dawn of the third uh, space age, I like to think. Um, so this is the SLS rocket, space launch system, uh, largest rocket ever built by, um, by humans, uh, and it's took off from Cape Kennedy uh, so a few, few weeks, or not that long ago, a week or so ago. And the, the, the very top bit, Orion, that small capsule at the top, is as we speak orbiting the moon um, before it, uh, it completes several orbits and then comes down back to Earth uh, in about 10 days or so. And that is a, a dress rehearsal for several more Artemis missions um, that are going to put humans back on the moon um, for the first time in over 50 years um, and then really develop into a permanent base on the moon all as a dress rehearsal for taking humans to Mars in the 2030s. Um, so hugely exciting time for space exploration. I call it the third generation uh, or you know third era of space exploration. Um, I unfortunately wasn't around for the first one when humans first went to the moon um, and that really, really exciting period um, of the Apollo missions and the first space race. Um, and then kind of not much public happened, I guess, through the kind of late 70s and 80s, although there was quite a bit of activity um, on the military space side for reconnaissance satellites and kind of um, a race for that kind of technology. And then in the like, last 25 years, so kind of 90s through the the noughties and, and into the teens and really, really accelerated at the moment was the kind of second uh, era of space. Um, I say space exploration, it was more space exploitation, really. It was uh, around using low Earth orbit um, to power systems here on Earth. So things like GPS in the 90s and you know, for the military in the 90s, and, and now everybody has GPS in their pocket. Uh, Sky TV, um, radio, satellite communications, Sky TV, all that stuff. Um, 
and now these mega constellations of, uh, of satellites um, powering uh, the internet and things like that um, as a second generation. And then here we are, th start of the third, uh, third era of space exploration. Really, really exciting. So I've stolen this slide or borrowed it from NASA. Um, this is, uh, you can go on NASA's website and, and you'll, you'll find this. This is their Moon to Mars Planning Manifest. Um, and basically shows the, the missions um, over the next 10 years that, that are the, you know, is the Artemis program, or the first 10 years of the Artemis program. So SLS-1 uh, just launched, as, as I said. Um, then in about a year and a half's time, uh, a crew are going to go on SLS-2. They're not going to land on the moon, but they're going to orbit the moon and then come back as a dress rehearsal to then go to the moon, land on the moon, um, and then come back. And that kind of uh, leads on to the later Artemis missions at the end of this decade to, to, to really put a permanent presence on the moon. That is the aim of uh, the first phase of the Artemis program, the moon phase, to get a permanent base on the moon. Um, so that all sounds really exciting, but this is, uh, you know, I'm not a rocket scientist. I'm a nuclear scientist, so what, why are we talking about all this? Uh, and really it's the, um, so the circle at the bottom of the slide there. To power um, some activities uh, as part of that moon base and, and as a dress rehearsal for uh, activities that are really required on the Martian surface, you need quite a bit of power. Uh, we're talking kind of, uh, not, not huge amounts of power, but tens, hundreds of kilowatts, uh, which you just can't really achieve with solar panels. Um, especially at some of the latitudes on, on the moon, um, some of the you know, South Pole, Southern latitudes, or areas of permanent darkness where water ice might exist. Um, so nuclear power is going to play a key part in providing the power for um, small, it says ISRU, in situ resource utilization plants, basically small scale mining and, uh, and milling of, um, of material, either uh, lunar regolith or, or Martian soil to extract water to create, um, well, to either, either for, for just water's sake or to then um, create hydrogen and oxygen as a, as a means of um, powering uh, the rockets to and from Mars. So nuclear power is already on the NASA Planning Manifest. They know they need it. Um, and there's programs in place which we'll kind of explore over the next 30 minutes or so. Um, to develop that technology and deploy that technology. Um, and I think the, the UK, as a nuclear nation, has really got, um, got some capability that we can bring to that and be part of these, uh, these missions and, um, uh, and the future of human space exploration. So space nuclear, uh, is, it's not a new idea. Um, it's been around for quite a long time, actually. Um, and, and it takes a, a few forms. Um, so on the left-hand side um, of the slide, you'll see uh, radioisotope um, power systems. Uh, they're not fission systems. They basically rely on the uh, natural decay of, uh, of a radioisotope. That produces heat, and that heat's uh, converted into electricity. Um, fairly low power systems, but fairly small. So that system on the slide there, that's the actual RTG uh, that is powering the Mars rover that's kind of cruising around the surface of Mars, taking some incredible photos and, and drilling for uh, soil samples at the moment. That is powered by a plutonium RTG. Uh, so not a new idea. Moving to kind of slightly bigger systems, fission systems, uh, again, they've been around for quite a while. Um, so that picture on the slide in the middle uh, is the SNAP-10A uh, nuclear reactor that the US developed in the, about the mid-60s. Um, pretty small, kind of, uh, I think it was about 10 kilowatts uh, electrical output, so quite a small, small system. Um, and they actually flew that system um, uh, and operated that reactor in space in, in orbit in, in the uh, early 60s, uh, about the mid-60s. The reactor itself is the small bit on top of that white cone, so it's a absolutely, you know, in reactor terms, tiny. Uh, yeah. And we have submarine reactors that are pretty small. This thing's absolutely minuscule. The white cone is, um, is all the radiator. That's just there to radiate away the kind of um, the excess heat. Uh, so really, really small system. The, the US, after that, um, that demonstration, the US then um, kind of didn't pursue that technology. 
but the Russians did, uh, and the Russians uh, from the late 60s through to the mid 90s powered their uh, reconnaissance satellites um, with two generations of nuclear fission reactors. Uh, so they launched 32 reactors in all, uh, and 31 of them are still <coughs> in orbit, albeit uh, not operational anymore. And then, <laughs> uh, even more exciting, uh, nuclear rockets. So again in the 60s, I always think the 60s would have been an amazing time to be a nuclear engineer, especially in America, they just tried everything. <clears throat> but in the, in the 60s, they looked at um, nuclear thermal propulsion. So it's a pretty straightforward concept. Um, you've got a, a tank of propellant, uh, so hydrogen, uh, and instead of combusting that hydrogen um, with oxygen and, and expelling that out of a nozzle to provide propulsion, uh, they just used a nuclear reactor to heat that hydrogen and then expand that, um, that gas or near enough a plasma um, out of the nozzle to provide propulsion. So it's only designed for in-space propulsion, uh, so you wouldn't uh, expel uh, gas that's been through a reactor uh, to, to launch a system, but, the, but it was designed for in-space propulsion. Uh, and they went pretty far down the line in the US on, uh, on, on nuclear thermal propulsion. Uh, there was a program um, called NERVA, um, and they tested about uh, over a dozen different iterations of nuclear thermal um, rockets on Earth, and tested them on Earth. Um, and if you ever want to waste half an hour on YouTube, uh, there's a fascinating old uh, US um, kind of State Department video about the NERVA program. It's absolutely brilliant. Go and watch it. So, so micro-reactors uh, are now um, back on the table, as I showed in the last slide, uh, for, for providing power for, uh, for the base uh, on, on the Moon and then into Mars. And nuclear thermal propulsion is now being seriously looked at for uh, providing the in-space propulsion for a transit vehicle from Moon to Mars. Uh, the kind of temperatures that uh, these reactors can get to, the thermal propulsion reactors, uh, the temperatures they can get to can um, provide a, a kind of twofold increase in the specific impulse of the, of the, uh, the vehicle. So it means you can kind of cut the transit time down uh, from about nine months to Mars to about six months to Mars. So, um, so, so real benefits and there's uh, active programs in the US developing that technology at the moment. So not a new idea. Bringing it a little bit more uh, up to date, um, over the past six years or so, um, NASA have been working in conjunction with uh, Los Alamos um, National Laboratory in the States to, um, to prove the idea that you can uh, build a small reactor uh, capable of operating on, on the moon. So they had um, a program called Killer Power, and again, you can waste uh, hours and hours on YouTube looking at all this stuff. Um, they had a program called Killer Power to design a one kilowatt electric reactor. Uh, and then they built this reactor at Los Alamos. Um, so the Krusty demonstrator, uh, is the kind of thing that these guys are working on uh, and it, uh, it was a land-based demonstrator of this one kilowatt uh, nuclear reactor. Really kind of fascinating and the first time really I think that uh, a brand new reactor architecture has been actually taken critical and tested in, in decades. Really interesting technology so um, and it's the, the picture in the middle there that's labelled uh, gives you an idea of the technology. So solid state core, so the core was about a coke, two litre coke bottle size of cast uh, uranium molybdenum. Um, so just a, a kind of solid block of uranium molybdenum. Um, that was a reactor core. And then on the outside of that reactor core to transfer the heat to the power conversion system, they um, essentially strapped, and they did strap, um, a series of liquid metal, liquid sodium heat pipes. Uh, so heat pipes are really, really efficient means of transferring heat. Uh, they're passive, no, no pumps. They essentially rely on um, uh, convection of, um, of, of the liquid within the, um, within the sealed tube. So you kind of boil off the liquid at one end, the vapor transfers to the other end, dumps its heat, and then there's a wick structure that pulls the liquid back down. Uh, to the hot end. Um, 
So they kind of had a series of, of liquid sodium heat pipes strapped to the outside of the core. They transferred the heat to then a series of Stirling engines, uh, which are essentially just a heat engine. Uh, they take that heat and uh, transfer it into mechanical energy, uh, and then there's a generator on the end of that um, on the end of that power piston. Um, so they built this thing and, and took it critical. Um, means of achieving criticality um, weren't totally prototypic. They used a, a movable reflector uh, to um, increase the reactivity of the core and take it critical. And it also acted as their um, shutdown mechanism to, to drop the reflector. Uh, such, such a small core, you can kind of co um, control the reactivity through leakage. Um, but they took they. They tested this thing and took it critical uh, back in 2018, I think it was. Um, and you, absolutely, uh, there's a ton of fascinating papers and, uh, and reports written about this. It was kind of all kind of almost public domain. Um, so they took it critical, took it through a whole load of uh, transients, proved its um, uh, kind of negative power coefficient. Um, so it kind of self-regulates itself by it increases in power, the core expands, and you leak more neutrons. Um, so they proved all that stuff out. Brilliant program. And they did all of that for about $15 million, which um, is actually quite cheap. Uh, so, so that's really set the stage now to, to, um, to the NASA budget holders, at least, to say nuclear power on this kind of small scale um, is feasible. Uh, so it's made it into their budget lines and onto their planning manifest that, that we saw just earlier. Um, so br brilliant piece of work. And there's loads and loads of good information out there. If, you, if you're sad like me and spend your nights on YouTube uh, Googling space reactors. Now, NASA aren't the only ones looking at um, nuclear power for space. Um, there is a technology race uh, underway. Um, so NASA, as I said, have, have now got this in their budget lines and in their program, and it is in their baseline program for Artemis. Um, so they've, uh, this, this white box on the side here, really, really interesting. This, they, NASA have um, they've kind of changed their model of technology acquisition for some things recently. Uh, so the likes of the a brilliant example is the human landing system. They actually put it out to tender. They said, we need a human landing system. Who wants to bid for it and design it? Uh, and there was a big competition between SpaceX and Blue Origin that's now in the courts. Um, but that's by the by. They're doing the same um, for the Fish and Surface Power program. Um, so there's a uh, request for industry proposals um, live right now. It's, a, it's an open industry competition to, uh, to design and ultimately develop a land-based prototype and then a, a, a flight prototype to send to the moon by the end of this decade. Really, really interesting and exciting. And, and, and unsurprisingly, I guess, um, China have said they're going to have a system that's 100 times more powerful than NASA's. <laughs> I'm not sh quite sure what they're going to do with all of that power on the moon, uh, but they've, they've kind of publicly said, stated that. And, and, and Russia are the same. They're, um, they are actively developing um, nuclear power for space applications. They're kind of going more down the propulsion route uh, than the kind of, uh, power for, for, for um, habitation bases. But there's an active program. Um, can't read too much about it, but there's an active program. And they're, they're, they're very willing to use that program kind of uh, in the press um, uh, uh, as part of the, this technology race. So, so back to the kind of title of, of this um, this discussion tonight, C can the UK play a part in, in this next giant leap? Um, so cl clearly, uh, I think they can through nuclear power, but does the government think that, I guess? So la last year, um, 2021, uh, the UK government issued the first ever national space strategy. Um, we've never had a national space strategy. We've had a space agency, uh, pretty small space agency for a while, but um, we're now getting a little bit more serious uh, kind of linked to the government rhetoric about being a technology and science superpower. Um, and now we have a national space strategy that lays out a, a series of, of, of goals um, uh, and, a, and a roadmap to achieve those goals. So 
unsurprisingly, I guess the space, the overarching space strategy goal that the government laid out last year was to grow and level up our space economy. So we have a fairly small space economy, but if you look at the kind of size of the global space economy and the rate of growth of that space economy, it's, it's huge. It's, it's a phenomenal rate of growth. Um, uh, so, so we really need to get on board uh, if, if we want to use space to grow our economy. So there's several uh, different strands to the national space strategy. Um, there's play into our current strengths, uh, and we do have quite a few current strengths. Uh, we're really, really good at uh, small satellites. Um, you've probably heard of Surrey satellites, um, uh, now owned by Airbus, but they're, they're, they're a kind of world-leading company in, in the development of small satellites. And then there's high growth areas, um, so things like uh, horizontal launch, um, so cheap, uh, a cheap means of delivering small satellites into orbit. Um, so that's kind of around the spaceports that you've probably seen in the news. There's um, spaceports being developed down in the, in the southwest, uh, Newquay uh, has got a spaceport, uh, and in the northeast in Scotland as well. And there's a whole kind of technology cluster growing around those spaceports in, in both locations. And I think, uh, I can't remember the date, but the first satellite launch from UK soil is kind of on the cards for the next, some, some time in the next couple of months. Uh, from one of those spaceports, horizontal launch to orbit. Uh, and then there's an emerg emerging sectors. So there's kind of all of these sectors of the space economy and space industry, uh, n new emerging sectors that the UK uh, wants to play a part in. So diving down into what, what, what are those emerging sectors, um, I was really, really, really happy to read this strategy when it came out because space-based energy was highlighted in that, um, in that strategy. So uh, some of our lobbying hadn't gone to waste. Government did shy away from talking specifically about nuclear power for space, um, but space-based energy is in that strategy. And then they, um, they kind of have this roadmap of, of, of what the government's going to do to uh, enable that strategy. So kind of the countdown phase in their language was all around the national space strategy and linking it to a national uh, defence space strategy. So we've just stood up a space command uh, in the MOD um, uh, and they're doing lots of uh, secret things uh, around reconnaissance and space awareness and um, space observation, that kind of thing. Um, so we now have a, a coherent space strategy across civil and defence. And then we go into this ignition phase, start funding programmes to establish UK capability. Uh, in some of these um, some of these emerging sectors, and then the thrust phase and orbit phase, uh, uh, we're not quite there yet, but it's to accelerate the development of these programs, really start to um, develop bilateral agreements, um, so uh, space agency and NASA agreements on technology collaboration, things like that. Um, so that, that first phase. Um, uh, and kind of why Rolls-Royce, why we're talking about this at Rolls-Royce. So that, through that first phase, um, we've been working in partnership with uh, the UK Space Agency for nearly the last two years, just yeah, somewhere between 18 months and two years. Um, and Space Agency have been, uh, have been funding us and, and working with us to develop um, a concept, of, first a, a feasibility kind of study uh, a, a, and a technology development roadmap around space nuclear power. Um, can the UK design a, um, a, a micro-reactor for, for providing power to the moon base? So um, Space Agency funded this first piece of work back in 2021, and then through this year, they've been funding a second piece of work um, that really starts that design. So we did a feasibility study to say, yeah, this, this looks pretty doable. And now uh, through, through this year, um, they've been funding the start of that design phase, uh, so the concept design phase for a for a UK space reactor, which is absolutely fascinating. I think I've got the best job in, uh, in Rolls-Royce at the moment, because this is brilliant stuff. Um, and and we, fingers crossed, as we go into that kind of phase two launch phase, um, UK government will continue to support the development of this, uh, this technology and this capability, all as a kind of positioning to, um, to position the UK um, 
to, to, to work with NASA and the US and provide this technology or, or collaborate on this technology into the Artemis missions. And the, as part of that kind of bilateral, um, uh, building bilateral ties, US and UK space agencies, um, NASA uh, seniors were over here a few months ago for the Farnborough Air Show, just at the end of summer. And um, there was a series of workshops after, after the air show down in London where um, a very senior, so Deputy Administrator for NASA, Pam Melroy, was here for a week with her team working with the UK Space Agency on the aims and objectives of the Artemis missions and where does the UK want to, where can the UK provide um, some technology um, and input, uh, collaboration input in, into, uh, into those missions. We, the UK is a signatory to the Artemis Accords, um, so there's a whole kind of set of accords that say we're going to go back to the moon and do it peacefully and do it for all mankind, etc. So the UK is a signatory to those Artemis Accords, and now we're exploring, or now the government's exploring, actually what are we going to contribute to those, to those missions. Um, and space nuclear is, is on that agenda. So really exciting. So... Before, I've got a, 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 just a few slides around the actual technology, um, which I'm sure will interest uh, a lot of this audience. Um, but just before we get to that, it's not just about space. Um, and, and I think really from the early days of space exploration, uh, and certainly for the Artemis missions today, it's not all about space. It's about, it is about space and space exploration, but it's also about technology development and then spin out um, benefits and applications of that technology to use you know, back here on Earth. And it's absolutely the case for microreactors as well. So space microreactors, um, as I said, are pr pretty small systems and they don't need that much power. But that, um, the same kind of architecture and the same you know, advanced fuel forms and the same um, automated control systems and things like that can be scaled up just a bit to provide um, micro reactors for, for use here on Earth. So there's just a few kind of examples of, of, uh, of those applications here on Earth that we've been looking at and doing some market evaluation and you know, business case evaluation around. So things like um, a, a small nuclear reactor, five megawatts electric output in the footprint of an ISO shipping container, what could you use that for? Quite a lot of things. So um, disaster relief for one, um, providing kind of power to um, refugee camps uh, and humanitarian aid missions, um, decarbonizing remote industry. Uh, the mining industry uses an incredible amount of diesel to power gen diesel gensets in remote locations and they pay an awful lot of money to get the diesel to those remote locations. So as well as decarbonizing their operations we can actually um, Make, make their operations cheaper, more economically sustainable. Um, and then things like remote communities. Um, a colleague of mine just spent a week in Alaska, lucky chap, um, talking to a remote community out there um, and linked actually to a, to, a, to a remote Air Force base out there that have put out a request for industry tenders to, to, to design and deploy a micro-reactor to power um, to power that uh, Air Force base and, and, and local community. Um, they currently use something ridiculous, like uh, I think it's 8,000 tonnes of coal uh, like a, a week. Uh, absolutely ridiculous amounts of coal to um, power a 10 megawatt coal-fired power station. And they, they want to you know, decarbonise. Uh, and then there's some defence applications. Um, the, um, the, the, the current conflict in Ukraine actually has really highlighted you know, energy assurance is key uh, for defence operations but also you know, civil operations. So things like you know, defence applications where you really want to be off-grid and you want to have assured power and not be reliant on a supply chain of, of diesel for gensets uh, or grid power. Things like Filingdales for example. Not necessarily saying I'm going to put a reactor in the North York Moors National Park, but, but those kind of applications um, are, are really, really, um, are, are a really attractive use case for micro reactors. So a little bit about you know what, what is a micro reactor then? How is it? Um, 
how is it different to the kind of pressurized water reactors or, or, or advanced gas reactors we're used to. So I talked a little bit about the, the, the kilopower demonstrator and that, and that was one architecture. We're, um, we're developing uh, basically a, a, a slightly higher power version of, of kilopower. Um, so kilopower is one, one kilowatt electric. You can't do too much with one kilowatt electric. You can run your air fryer or your kettle, but uh, not much else. So we're developing a, a higher power system. Um, and essentially, that system um, comprises of two pretty basic building blocks. You've got your reactor core to provide heat, and then um, you've got a turbine um, to, to drive a generator. So Rolls-Royce are pretty good at turbines, um, especially on this campus. We design and develop you know, very large gas turbines. Um, so we've got a lot of expertise in the group around, um, uh, around turbines and compressors. So essentially, we're taking uh, a gas turbine architecture and then taking the uh, compressor, uh, sorry, the combustor out of the middle of that um, and replacing it with uh, a nuclear heat source. Uh, and that's pretty much as simple as you can make these, um, these Brayton cycle uh, systems. Um, so how the, how the whole system works, you've got a, a compressor and that um, is, is essentially a pump. Uh, pumps gas through the reactor core, reactor core makes it hot, expand that hot gas then through a turbine which in turn drives your tur uh, compressor to drive the system uh, and, and uh, a generator, an electrical gen generator uh, on that um, or on a separate shaft actually. Uh, and that's Pretty, pretty much it. There's some complications or there's some options, design space options around um, recuperating and intercooling and reheating um, some of those gases, but, but that's all a trade-off between kind of system performance and system weight, especially for space. Um, to give you a kind of, si you know, some context on the size of these systems, for space, the, the turbine for a 40 kilowatt uh, system, which is which is what NASA asked for for the first demonstrator, 40 kilowatt electric. The um, the turbine and compressor is essentially, is essentially the same size as a turbocharger in a large truck engine. It's pretty small, literally this kind of size. And the core equivalent, you know, the core to power that generator, uh, well, that, that that cycle is um, is also pretty small, that size of a kind of waste paper basket. So really, really small system. And then for Terrestrial uses, you know, some artist impressions here. So, so for terrestrial uses, um, you scale that up to get to kind of the five megawatt, uh, to five megawatt range. Uh, five megawatt turbine um, is almost kind of equivalent to a business jet gas turbine engine. So again, pretty small, power dense machines. And the core, um, not not quite wheelie bin size, somewhere between a waste paper basket and a wheelie bin. So pretty small systems. Um, yeah, some artist impressions on. on it. My, my main job is trying to keep the engineering at a pace with the graphic designers. It's really, really hard. So I just wanted to dive into one aspect of, uh, especially for this audience, I wanted to dive into one aspect of of, um, of the technology and a real key aspect, and that's the fuel. Um, so these systems, if, if you're kind of used to uh, you know, normal nuclear reactors, civil reactors, uh, they have kind of large containment vessels and large containment buildings around those vessels. Um, and that's all pretty big stuff. You do well to squeeze that down into a shipping container. Now, one of the kind of key enabling technologies that allows that um, you know, miniaturization of the architecture is the fuel technology. Um, and, and specifically a, a fuel form called triso, uh, so tristructural isotropic uh, fuel, uh, essentially uh, co coated particles. Um, so what the fuel, uh, what this fuel form is, kind of really, really small spheres of um, uranium, uranium oxide. Uh, so that's the kind of sphere in the middle of that picture. And then that sphere of uranium is coated in three layers, as, you, as the name suggests, tristructural three layers of um, protective um, coatings. So there's a, um, there's a, there's a buffer layer of uh, graphite, essentially. So an absorption layer to absorb fission product gases, 
um, and allow that kind of central uh, fuel kernel to, to, to swell and expand uh, as it needs to through life. And then concentric layers of uh, different forms of carbon. So a silicon carbide, uh, super high strength, um, and then a pyrolytic carbon, uh, really high temperature resistance, and then another um, silicon carbide layer around that to keep everything in. So, so that all sounds great, good gobstopper of fuel there. What does that do for you? It, it, it kind of takes those containment buildings and containment vessels and shrinks it all down to the, to the kind of fuel form itself um, so that under any accident scenario or transient scenario, uh, if anything was to happen to the fuel inside, you, you cannot get the release of fission products uh, from these particles. So those kind of containment buildings and, and containment structures shrunk down right to the fuel form, which provides you know, a, a huge safety benefit and, uh, and, and really allows these systems to be shrunk down and, and made small enough to fit inside a shipper container. Um, context on size, so there's a, there's a, that's a thumb, the thing in the blue, um, and that's a vial of, of triso um, coated particles. So they're tiny. They're about the size of a poppy seed, uh, individually, really small. And then those poppy seeds uh, of, of uh, fuel are um, uh, basically sintered into um, pellets, so they're, they're, they're suspended in a matrix material, graphite, um, generally graphite. Um, and then those make up the compacts, and then you can build your core out of those compacts. Um, real kind of game changer um, for, for these kind of small deployable nuclear systems. The uh, TRISO is actually a UK invention back in the 70s. Uh, the UK was the first place to develop this fuel uh, and run it in, um, in the Dragon Test Reactor um, back in the 70s. Um, Unfortunately, we haven't quite kept, uh, kept the development going from the 70s to now, um, and we don't have a UK capability to make this fuel at the moment. There's an, another government pro programme, a funding programme, um, that's uh, been undertaken at the National Nuclear Lab up in Cumbria and, and Preston to um, develop a, a UK kind of modern manufacturing technique to, to actually make this fuel and develop the techniques and the manufacturing methods to make this fuel. It's a really, really exciting uh, development. Um, so then on to the kind of overall um, roadmap. Um, so I'm not a project manager, so I love this kind of plan. A uh, lot of wiggle room. Um, essentially, yeah, so to get to a first of a kind, you know, the NASA timescales, uh, first of a kind uh, product re or micro reactor ready for the late 20s, um, that's their need date. You kind of ha we, we've already started. So we've, as I said, we've uh, been undertaking the kind of feasibility study and the early concept design over the last 18 months or so. We're now into this kind of technology development phase, um, and next year we're going to be actually doing some physical tests on some of the some some prototype uh, components and subsystems of, of this uh, reactor design. Uh, while we continue to, to uh, mature and, and detail out the actual design. Then into a kind of verification and validation and a real testing phase. There's a big blob there, big planet for prototype testing. Um, so uh, actually as part of the, the NASA contractual requirements um, and, and the funding provision, there is funding for a land-based or you know, Earth-based prototype. Um, to really prove the system out in a you know in a Earth environment before we send it to the moon, uh, then on to kind of build off that first system and and, and into um, into flight tests and t taking it to the moon, um, and and the kind of I've talked a lot about space there. The micro reactor terrestrial program, the kind of shipping container reactor, is essentially there's a whole load of commonality between those two systems, not necessarily in size, but in a lot of the subsystems and the component technologies and the fuel technology that I talked about. So it's, it's the same program essentially with a few few divergences along the way. So by 2030, um, if, if the government plays their cards right over the next couple of years um, uh, and creates those bilateral agreements with NASA, 
Um, the UK, I think, will be in a position where we're um, contributing nuclear reactor technology to those Artemis missions. And, and this is kind of what it's all about, really. Um, I'll, I'll kind of end, end on this. A vision of the future and a vision of a moon base with uh, UK-provided micro-reactors uh, and nuclear technology. And, and the real kind of... Um, well, not the real goal, but one, one of the benefits is to, um, through, the, through those Artemis Accords and providing technology into those missions, we will get UK boots on the moon into that moon base. So Tim Peake's daughter in 2030s will be on the moon um, with, a, with an international um, crew, crew in that permanent base on the moon. So that's it. Hopefully that was enjoyable and um, we can now open up, we've got 15 minutes or so for any questions. So I think there are a couple of mics around. Um, brilliant. So any questions? If, if we just wait for uh, we just wait for the microphone to get to you. Thank you. While we're waiting for the microphone, there's another huge benefit to <coughs> the space nuclear program, and that is the um, the, the skills agenda um, and the you know getting um, uh, young people really excited about nuclear technology for these kind of applications, uh, and then getting people to, to go into STEM subjects and study you know science, technology, um, maths and, uh, and engineering and physics. Uh, as, as a feeder into the UK nuclear industry. Well, first of all, thanks for my notes. That was tremendous. Um, the question really is prompted by the um, little footnote you have on all your slides there. So you talked a lot about the kind of governmental levels of engagement, and obviously it's a highly regulated industry. What is the landscape like, do you think, if everybody's Mars-obsessed billionaire says, I want 10 of those on my Mars base, because that's, that's private enterprise, isn't it? So I imagine there's a lot of regulatory stuff that could be an impediment there. Uh, yes, uh, and we have had that conversation. Um, the, uh, and and the, what I didn't touch on here, because we've kind of focused on the Artemis missions, is if, if, you, if you kind of take what happened with low Earth orbit as an, as an analogy, actually there could be quite a you know, commercialization of lunar operations and potentially Martian operations, if you believe Elon. Uh, Timescales, I'm not quite sure I agree, but... Uh, so, so there is a, there is a commercial you know, uh, advantage to developing these systems. But you're absolutely right, the, the kind of... Um, the, the, there's going to have to be... The, there's a gap at the moment uh, in the kind of regulatory regime around um, who has... Uh, you know, approval authority for a space-based nuclear system. Um, it's, uh, and, and, and that's kind of been worked through in the US, um, but, it, but no one's actually pipe cleaned and tested that system yet. So they've kind of been working through, in the US anyway, around N NRC, what, what role does the NRC play, what role does NASA play, what role does the FAA play, etc. And they've kind of worked it out and... Um, and they've kind of worked out the launch approval for this, which goes, uh, I, th I think it's one step below presidential approval to actually launch a reactor. So, so, so that you're right, there's, a, there's, a, there's probably as much uh, regulatory and policy work to do as there is engineering work to do to, to get a system into space. Uh, certainly a commercial system. For, for the NASA program, I think that will be a slightly easier route. Um, but for a commercial system, there's quite a lot of legislation still to be developed. If that answers the question. OK, yeah. We'll come to you next, I think. Thanks again for the presentation, very good. Um, very basic question, you talked about the fuel being, the, the surrounding uh, protection around the fuel, so you're not going from the big building, it's down on the fuel itself. How do you then use it? 
Uh, yeah, good good question. So those those, those layers are um, those layers around the fuel that I talked about, silicon carbide, pyrolytic carbon, uh, incredibly strong and um, fantastic kind of uh, mechanical encapsulation of the fuel. Um, but neutrons don't care about that. They'll they'll fly straight through that material uh, and find you know a uranium nuclei in a uh, an adjacent um, particle to, to then fission. So so in terms of kind of uh, you know the physics and and um, the the nuclear chain reaction, they're pretty much impervious to those layers. Um, a, a lot like I guess uh, the structural steels and things that are used in uh, in today's cores. Um, so fantastic for mechanical en encapsulation, but yeah, neutrons don't care, they're pretty small. Thank you. We had a question down here at the front, Ben. Is my voice loud enough for people to hear the microphone? I think it's been recorded, so if, um, yeah, it'll be a lot easier. Thank you. I, I was aware of the, uh, the, that the neutrons are going to sort of come out, so presumably the, the structure of the uh, device is going to end up irradiated. Uh, you're going to have low-level waste from that, and presumably you also need some strategy to deal with the spent fuel, which is going to be hanging around for some considerable time. And if uh, we do end up going out into the moon and Mars, our following generations are not going to be too happy if there's uh, 20,000 light year, uh, year half-life uh, waste hanging about. Yeah, yeah very, very good question and, a, and, a, and, a, and very similar to a question that I, I posed at a roundtable event to, um, to some of the, some of the uh, NASA program execs recently around end-of-life liabilities for these systems. We have to absolutely consider end-of-life liabilities now. Because you're quite right, um, you know, we, we, we have to go to the moon sustainably. Um, so, so, so that, uh, and, and there, isn't, um, there isn't a super clear answer around that, apart from we have to do it sustainably and, and, you know, and, and sensibly. And NASA are developing the policies around, okay, well, what does happen to these systems at the end of life? Um, much like a reactor here on Earth, you can't, you, you don't get certification, you can't build a reactor here on Earth unless you have a, you know, a, a, a decommissioning plan. Uh, and it's the same, and NASA taking that same approach. It's not a total straightforward answer about what you do. There's several options. You, you can bury it and clearly mark the site. Um, or, or you can launch these things and put them into a huge uh, uh, solar system orbit so you'd never see it again or you could fire it into the sun all those kind of things so there isn't a, a there isn't a super clear answer now um, but the as a policy question that is uh, is a live kind of debate right now as to how do we responsibly um, deal with these systems at their end of life So just as a follow-on to the gentleman's question on the front, what would be a typical lifetime for one of your um, systems? Yeah, good uh, question. Bearing in mind the, the burn-up of this um, highly enriched uranium fuel. So, so I, yeah, I, I, um, I didn't really talk about the enrichment, but the, uh, well, actually, uh, the NASA requirement is not to use highly enriched uranium, uh, and, and kind of makes sense, and, and for terrestrial micro-reactors, it makes absolute sense not to use HEU from a proliferation point of view. So these systems um, would use high assay, low enriched uranium, so below 20% enrichment. Uh, in terms of, terms of lifetime, uh, I get to the, the, the NASA spec, which is the, you know, the spec for space, they are the customer at the moment, uh, is for a 10-year core life. So they want 10 years operation from that unit. Can you refuel them then? Not uh, I think it'd be pretty hard to refuel the space system, uh, and it's it's not going to be designed for refueling. Terrestrial systems, yes, would be designed for refueling. Uh, and notice that all your drawings didn't show any bio shields for for um, shielding on these systems. Presumably, there's a, a fairly um, large bio shield to go around the core on these systems. 
Yes, yeah, um, there is. Um, and again, in the specs, there's you know pretty stringent specs on you know dose to an astronaut at 1K and all that kind of stuff. And then these, these I don't know if you're referring to these, but they're kind of petals at the top. They're the um, they're equivalent to the white code in the original you know NASA SNAP 10A reactor. They're um, they're radiators to radiate away the excess heat and, and create the delta T for the um, for the whole system to work. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Yes. Um, question: the, your, the the small unit theory of gravity in space. How does when they're just shields as well? How does the um, power to weight ratio compare with a current rocket fuel? And secondly, an answer possibly to the question the gentleman is asking about what do you do with the waste? You could use one of your nuclear power things and just send it off to the sun, couldn't you? So, so the, the, the um, yeah, the, uh, the disposal route of sending something to the sun is, it, it, it is a viable option. Um, that's certainly in the debate. Uh, and then the, 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 the first part of the question, I, uh, let me clarify, the, um, you're talking about the nuclear thermal propulsion yes. rockets. Yeah, and, and what was the question, sorry? The power to weight ratio. Power to weight ratio. Yeah, okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, so yeah, the question was around um, comparison of the power to weight ratio between um, chemical rockets of today and, and the nuclear thermal propulsion rocket that um, the NERVA program stuff that I talked about earlier. Um, so, the um, so I don't have an exact answer, but I do have um, an answer on the specific impulse. So, um, and, and the sp specific impulse is uh, the amount of thrust per pound of uh, propellant uh, used. Um, so current chemical rockets, uh, the, the best chemical rockets have a specific impulse of about 400 seconds. Um, nuclear thermal propulsion rockets can get up to and ab uh, an above 900 seconds. So um, a, you know, kind of significant increase on the specific impulse. Um, and that's really driven by the um, temperature of the reactor uh, and the fact that you only have to carry one of the molecules of a chemical system. So in a chemical system, you might carry oxygen and hydrogen and you know, burn them. Um, in a nuclear system, you'd only carry the light one. So you'd carry hydrogen and then use the reactor and a, and a very high temperature reactor to, um, to accelerate uh, that, you know, that molecule um, and then exhaust it out of the jet nozzle. Um, so you save the weight of you know, more than half the propellant because oxygen is much heavier than hydrogen. Uh, but then you replace some of that propellant weight with a reactor that provides really, really high temperature. Um, thank you. It's been a fascinating lecture. Really enjoyed it. Um, so, the Americans have been working on nuclear power, military and civil. The Americans develop turbine technologies. What is it that gives you confidence that UK and Rolls-Royce can bring something extra competitive to the table that yeah. means we could be involved. Yeah, no, really, really good question. A um, couple of things. Um, the, um, one of the stated aims of the Artemis missions uh, and, the Arte uh, and then the reason for the Artemis Accords is uh, the, the US want this to be a, uh, an international collaboration effort. So they don't want to have just a U.S. flags on this moon base. Um, they want to do that because it's a good thing to do. They also want to do that, so it's not just the U.S. Um, having influence on outer space treaties and it become a U.S., Russia, China uh, thing. A little bit like NATO and, and why they like having other people with a deterrent. So, so that's a big driver for them, um, and they've... You know, in all of the Artemis documents, they all talk about international collaboration. The, the Orion capsule on the top of the rocket that I showed right at the start, um, that had a European-built service module. Uh, top bit was built in America, but the service module and the propulsion module um, was, was built in Europe. Uh, and they see this, you know, so, so they see the, they see the uh, I guess, the political benefits of international collaboration. Um, why I think we, uh, the UK could play on, on nuclear is we, um, we have a, 
um, not, not unique, but almost unique capability in the UK um, on nuclear. Uh, and, and we collaborate with the US quite extensively on nuclear programs already. So there's a, uh, there's a precedent um, that actually the UK knows what it's doing. And Rolls Royce is a part of that. Okay, just a couple more questions. Yeah, hi. So um, you mentioned the old um, one kilowatt reactor used the reflectors instead of normal control rods. Is that the plan for this new one, or is that going to be too power dense and we need another system for it? So, so it's a good question. There's there's several um, several different means of reactivity control and um, uh, and protection that we're looking at. So scram capability. Um, Movable reflectors is, is one way you can do that. Um, that was really good for the Los Alamos um, test uh, because they could drop that, react that, that reflector and it would shut the reactor down. Um, that's possibly not the most optimum solution for a, you know, a deployed uh, reactor. Um, so we're looking at combinations of um, uh, control rods still, um, but also movable um, control drums. So having drums around, the core is really small, so you don't have a lot of space for lots of rods. You might have one, one shut down rod in the middle. But then around the core, having drums that essentially rotate, uh, and, and on one side they'll have a reflector, and on the other side have an absorber material. And you can kind of rotate those and, and um, control the amount of neutron absorption or, 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 or leakage or reflection back into the reactor. Uh, so that that's the kind of primary means of reactivity control. Hi, hey, um, I re really enjoyed the talk, thank you very much. Um, the biggest difference between Earth and Moon is probably like the lower gravity on Moon. Will that have any effect on the coolant that you might use? And when you get to the prototyping stage, how are you hoping to test that? Yeah, no, re re really good question. And, and I we never thought we'd get into all this stuff, but you start talking about operating in the lunar environment, there's all these kind of weird uh, and wonderful uh, new requirements you've got to deal with, like microgravity. Um, so, so yes, it does have, a, does have an impact on the design, especially in, the, in what we were just talking about um, in kind of um, reactor shutdown operations, because you can't rely on gravity. So unlike kind of gravity-driven uh, scram mechanisms here on Earth, you can't rely on that on the Moon, so you have to have kind of uh, other means of shutdown. Um, in terms of kind of coolant stuff that you were talking about, um, gas you know, pumped gas coolant um, and actually heat pipes as well uh, have both been used in space before um, uh, and kind of proven out in zero gravity. Um, so so they're, they're not an issue, but there are lots of other kind of uh, space and environmental requirements that are quite different. W one of the major ones, really, uh, just ironically, is, um, is, is radiation. It's, got, it's quite, quite a, uh, uh, a radiation-intensive environment on the Moon. Thank you. OK, I think we'll uh, stop it there for the moment. Um, I'm sure Jake will be around for a little while after the talk, if anyone has any further questions. and. Uh, I think you'll join me now in just showing some appreciation for Jake and putting on this talk for us. Thank you very much. Diane, I'd just like to say thank you to the LDC for um, hosting us this evening, Quadrant for doing the uh, AV, and Stephen for doing the uh, interpreting for BSL. Uh, we, as I said previously, the, we'll still have access for the building till about nine o'clock. The Rolls Royce Museum is currently open if anyone wants to have a look around there. And I'd encourage everyone to either scan their, um, their leaflet in front of them or take it with them home for an opportunity to attend IOP events in Derby in the future. Thank you very much, everyone.